Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the River City Labs Activate Pitch and Demo event. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders were the first scientists, astronomers, geologists, ecologists and engineers building their deep knowledge about the nature of the world in which we live for thousands of generations. Here in Australia, scientists today continue to build on the tradition of inquiry, curiosity and custodianship, adding to the rich social and scientific knowledge of the country. I respectfully acknowledge the Irigora and Turrbal people as the traditional owners and First Nations people of the land where I'm speaking from today. I recognize that this land was taken. I pay my respect to elders past and present and to emerging community leaders. I also extend respect to all First Nations people. Today you will hear from the eight startups who have been immersed in a five week intensive mentoring program supported by our entrepreneurs in residence, Lou Jury and Peter Laurie, mentors and partners of River City Labs. With the focus to qualify and validate their idea and business model, then to commercialize and go to market. Very shortly, you'll have the opportunity to see change through technology and how we transact online, how inventory management can be transformed, how the trade industries are leveraging technology better to serve them, and how our life experiences are turned from a moment into a journey. Digital health is finally here and our youth get access to real world professionals. And we all now know who is behind the creative. The pitches will be five minutes followed by two minutes of Q&A. If you do have a question, feel free to pop it in the chat and I will call on you during the Q&A period. If we don't get to your question, don't worry. As following the pitches, you will have an opportunity to have a further Q&A and networking session in breakout rooms with the founders of your choice. Please just privately message the River City Labs in chat and let them know who, who you would like more time with as the pitches take place. So without further ado, please extend a virtual clap for our first founder who will be speaking, Nick Higgins, founder of Career Chats. Thanks, Pauline. Hi everyone, my name's Nick and I'm the founder of Career Chats. I want to illustrate the problem that Career Chats is solving by talking about my career path. When I was in year 12, like many 17 year olds, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I ended up deciding to study law and commerce simply because I was good at English, I had the grades to get in and I didn't know any better. So I went away and spent the next six years at UQ studying law and commerce. And the result? Six years later, I was miserable. My personality didn't resonate with the corporate culture and I didn't feel fulfilled by the work. The reason for this is simple. I knew next to nothing about law or commerce before investing six years of my life into it. What I needed was more information, unique insights into what the actual profession was like. I needed stories like that of Hannah. Hannah is a green coffee buyer, but before this, she had a very similar path to myself. She went through the corporate world by studying finance and then working in an office for three years before she too found that she wasn't, she didn't resonate that well with the corporate world. She then found green coffee buying. And I can tell you, Hannah absolutely loves being a coffee buyer. But the thing is, I personally didn't know that was a career that existed until recently. And it's the same for many people out there and especially for students. And these are the kind of stories and insights that are more important than they've ever been for students finishing high school. As the world of work is continuing to change, in a world that has events like COVID-19, the future of work is unknown. Career advisors haven't experienced 99% of the careers that are out there, and teachers and parents are lost on where to navigate their, their children to when there's new and emerging careers popping up all the time. And that is why I wanna introduce you to the Netflix for Career Education. So far, we've got 120 videos from over 30 different fields. And with this, we're growing every day. We're sharing insights from professionals like me and you who are giving genuine feedback to students coming through now. And the great thing about it, all these videos have been recorded during COVID. So they are discussing with students how the future of work is shaping up to be. The way we're gonna turn this into a business is twofold. Firstly, it's through going through the schools. 
So with that, we're going to be offering a $2,000 per year license, but this is going to be dependable on the number of students. And then from here, there'll be a number of marketing opportunities which present themselves, as it's a very tr attractive proposition for organizations like universities, TAFEs, online courses like Udemy and Coursera, as well as job seeking sites like Seek to advertise on career chats. When I look back just a month ago, when we started to really push career chats, I had zero tra traction and just 50 videos. Now we've got 120 videos and amazing traction. We've partnered with ACS, which gives us access to launch our pilot program through five schools, expanding to 15. We're also in continued ongoing talks with prominent schools, including two GPS schools in Brisbane. And while we continue to grow our video content, we're also looking at ways to incorporate profiling software, as well as an alumni and mentor portal for the students to engage and interact with. Once the international student market comes back, this is obviously going to be a very lucrative option for us to pursue, and that's something we will, we will engage with. And we also want to look to launch in the UK by 2023. So I'm Nick, I'm the founder of Career Chats. I'm a UQ Law graduate, I'm a qualified lawyer, and I've been a successful reseller of an e-commerce platform, which is, also, which is still running in the UK. What we're looking for in the coming months is a CTO to join us to connect up the alumni portal as well as the profiling software. Our ask is simple. A lot of you out there have very great and interesting career paths and we would love to hear from you. So I ask you today, if you're interested and you see the potential and the vision of what we're trying to achieve at Career Chats, to make an application to do a quick five minute video of your journey so far. This can be instrumental in helping the students of tomorrow grow into professionals and be constructive and give a lot of value to society. We're also looking for introductions to schools, organizations, alumni groups that may assist us in growing the vision of Career Chats. I'd like to thank you for listening. I'm Nick, um, this is Career Chats and we are 120 videos and growing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. And now I will open up for Q&A. So does anyone have any questions for Nick? Feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask a question. Hey, Nick, it's Anthony here. Um, my quick question, which I haven't asked you in the past, but will there be an opportunity for students to interact with the career people and ask questions directly? Like, is that a service that's in your pipeline? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's something that we do want to incorporate down the track. Um, and that is something why we would love to bring on a CTO to integrate that. To give Once they've watched a video that they're interested in, to also give them that option to speak with a professional doing what they are, might be interested in. And in particular, from an alumni within their school, who's either been there and done that, or another alumni from a university, TAFE or college in which they're looking to go. Cool. Thanks, Nick. Sounds like you've answered everyone's questions, Nick. Hey, Nick sorry, just a quick question. Um, Gopi here, just a quick one. Why now? Um, you know, what, what has kind of changed in the market that's making this kind of a burning problem that needs to be solved and anything technology wise that's enabled the problem to be solved now? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think the, the key with that is the current situation that we're faced with. The world of work is changing and more than it ever has. Um, the way in which the emerging market of jobs is coming out is it's, it's unknown what the, the future of work will be. The traditional paths of law, medicine, finance, accounting, engineering are no longer often wanted by the students um, in high schools. They want to pursue alternative paths and unique paths. Um, and that's why we believe there is a massive opportunity to educate them on these um, unique opportunities for them to go down different paths. G'day, Nick. Paul here from Untold. Um, just a, a quick question about um, your outreach to the schools and TAFE colleges, etc. Have you looked into perhaps getting some uh, a program of training or certification for those counsellors who you mentioned who are just so out of touch? Um, because if they could participate more in your platform, see the videos, understand those careers better, they could be better at their jobs? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we really want to collaborate with the career guidance counsellors and within the, each school, 
they all have their own form of career education. Um, a lot of it is quite outdated um, and we want to be able to offer this as a product for them to show and utilize and, and work with their students in their school. Nick, uh, Paul Wilson here. I'd like to make a comment if you don't mind, not a question so much. I had to, in the past, interview final year students for INET for develop, software developer uh, jobs. I noticed and I found it very disappointing that almost none of them had the faintest idea what to expect when they left the university and took the first steps out into industry. I also noticed that the university was very reluctant to get involved in trying to tell them things. So I actually think that something that you're doing is going to be extremely valuable, not just to, to the school leavers at year 12. University kids need this too when they leave. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Paul. I, um, and I think that is something that we will look, in, look into down the, down the track, but it's something that we want to grow first through the school system. Excellent. Thank you everyone for your questions and thank you so much, Nick, um, uh, for showing us what Career Chats is all about. So next up we do have is Maria, Marie Bear, sorry, <laughs> and I know Marie very well. Um, Marie Bear is from 1G. So over to you, Marie. Good evening, everyone. I'm Marie Baer, and I'm founder and CEO of 1G, a Forbes top 50 health tech company. And our mission is to champion the best health treatment for people. So this is Kyleen, one of our customers, and she has a chronic condition and she has to see multiple doctors all the time and she feels vulnerable and out of control in managing her health. And each time she has to repeat her health history over and over. And this impacts on her being diagnosed. But she's not alone because 50% of the population suffer from chronic illness and many also have more than one. And now we have COVID-19 where scientists have recently discovered that those that have survived 19 have um, more than likely going to have chronic, uh, chronic illness ongoing. So Kylene is like our, our customers identified where we have, where they have one chronic condition such as diabetes, cancer or arthritis uh, in this age group uh, from US and the UK. And this is, uh, we've been understanding this through, through Facebook. It's a highly, highly engaged audience. Um, that we've been talking to and validating the problem and validating that it's about 3.3 million. But because chronic illness is such a massive problem and we have ongoing issues of managing testing and immunisation such as COVID, uh, we believe that Wanji is suitable for everyone worldwide. And this is because if people have health records, they're mainly on pieces of paper, mainly maybe in manila folders or possibly in a Google Drive. But these are not necessarily secure or private. But with Wanji, it's like a Dropbox, secure and more. At Wanji, we're focusing on providing a solution for people to have health data captured by them combined with data captured in other places, such as devices and health records. So Wanji is a platform where you can track your symptoms and your health records and provide yourself reporting whenever you need it. So this is the process. At your next doctor's appointment, scan and load your health information. Before your doctor visit, export your health history and take it along to improve your chances of diagnosis. You can receive a daily health forecast which tells you your, your medications and your appointments and reminds you to track your symptoms. And because your health records and your uh, information is in one place, you're not going to lose those referrals and prescription documents anymore. And this new process is a game changer for us, it's launching soon. 
you, at your next doctor's appointment, take a photo of your health record, scan and load into Wanji, review it for accuracy, and then you're done. You're starting to collect your health history. So our business model so far has been B to C. But moving forward, imagine the possibilities of partnerships with Wanji's, chronic illness information, health information, um, research and testing possibilities. So to date, we've been in a pilot state, working with our initial paid pilot customers, a small amount of those, validating our functionality and our value. But from now, we're, with funding, we're projecting to increase our traction into next year and work with new partners and increase our functionality. So to do this, we're looking at 1.3 million investment to increase our traction with marketing and support our customers and operation and service. And of course, our technical resources and technology. Here's some ideas for the partnerships that may be opportunities for some people in the audience or some people that you know. Come and talk to us about these, these problems and let's see how we can help. I'm so proud of my, my team, like the current 1G team, that focus on digital health, design, and engineering to connect health information. This is the team to take us into the future. And our customers are also giving us feedback. Dr. Karen says this app has exceeded her expectations. <laughs> Kyleen says she values that we're actually talking to our users. And Steve found us through CNET, where we're listed as the top secure app to store your health records. So thank you for listening today. If you're an investor in the audience, consider backing Wanji, because in the future, we may need to carry our health information with us. Think about the corona tests. And Wanji is leading the way in this technology. Help us shape the future of digital health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. So we've actually got a few questions from the audience um, and some are similar. So I might um, kick off and ask this one. Uh, what, does, uh, what does Wanji have that my health record doesn't? Uh, very good question and thank you for that. Um, if you looked at our top diagram there, Wanji is, oh, sorry, the uh, my health record is a source of health information, all right? And one, what Wanji is trying to do is combine information from different sources. Okay, we do have another question from Paul. Uh, Marie, how are you handling the personal information you collect? The personal information is secured server, uh, <laughs> stored securely uh, according to HIPAA compliance. Thank you. I'll just open it up to the audience. Are there any more questions for Marie? One from Jason. Jason, did you want to ask that question? Yeah, I'll come off mute. Um, yeah, Marie, no, listen, great. Thanks for that. I, I was wondering, I noticed that both of your testimonials were from the US. So just a bit of a flavour, you know, launch there. How are you finding the US at this time? Well, thank you for that question. Great, Jason, excellent question. In fact, we have launched globally and most of our customers at the moment are from U US, some are from the UK, a little bit of Canada and Ireland. Um, but I guess what we're seeing globally is the people in US really feel this problem more than others. Uh, thanks for that. I suspected that might have been, you know, what you were finding if you were, um, you know, launched over there. So great. Mm -hmm. Marie, I've worked for Queensland Health for a bit here and there. Um, my understanding is that in Australia, there's no automatic right for patients to have access to their full medical records, partly because there's a concern that, or well, a feeling that it's because the doctor's writing so bad, you won't be able to read it. But that apart, there's a, there's a natural concern that um, if you don't actually understand the technical terms being used, they're easy to misunderstand. Bearing in mind that patients don't have that right, how much information can you reasonably be expected to, to uh, take for a patient and store it? Well, I guess 
I'm looking at things through the consumer's lens. And if we take, for example, the scan and load, pro load process, which we're just about to, to launch, this is where someone is actually taking a photo of a health document. It might be a shared health summary. It might be a script. It might be a test results. And um, using our Wanji capability, we're able to upload that and store it in, in, in as a uh, personal health record. So there's, there's no interpretation there. It's really about factual information and about the person then having that in their record so that next time they go to a doctor's appointment and they get asked, well, what happened last time? What happened when you went to the hospital or your test results? Then the, the person can then actually show them um, from those results, where it's at the moment, people have nothing, you know, it's, it's just simply from their memory or, or word of mouth. My understanding is that's not actually true. I mean, my test results go to my GP every single time. And in fact, I get a phone call from her a week later telling me either it's all right or you need to do this or something equivalent, all of which is great. But my question still really is, patients do not have access to the bulk of their test results done by hospital um, path labs. So there's a very strict limit to what the patient has access to, which in turn means there's a limit to what you can store. Well, therein lies the problem, I guess, which, which moving forward, uh, you know, if consumers start actually asking for, for access to some of their health information, that may change. Okay. It's an interesting project, I must admit. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And that's uh, where we've reached the top of our two minutes Q&A. So thank you so much, Marie. Thank you. Uh, so, so next up, we do have uh, Julian and Dan from Depot Buddy. Over to you guys. Good afternoon. I'm Julian. Uh, and this is Dan, and we're co-founders of Depot Buddy. Our goal is to empower small wholesalers and distributors to effectively manage their warehouse operations. Have you noticed how shelves this year have been empty? The coronavirus pandemic has been a massive disruptor to our supply chains, but the problem is not isolated to just this year. Fluctuating consumer demand is normal and is a symptom of a problem higher up the supply chain. Meet Trevor. He runs a warehouse here in Brisbane, supplying electrical trade equipment to merchants, which he sources from overseas. He uses Excel spreadsheets and zero to accounting to run his business. These have served him well traditionally for the last few years, but his business is now struggling. He's understocked and as a result has lost sales revenue. Previously, he was overstocked and suffering from cash flow problems by overcapitalizing on inventory. Why the polar opposites? Ultimately, he hasn't had the right information at the right time to manage his business. Trevor needs to know which products to buy, when to buy, and in what quantities. When purchasing, neither Excel nor Xero allow him to effectively identify the stock he needs. Consequently, his stock levels do not meet customer demand and his profit margins are affected. Competitors are not the solution. Existing software products attempt to solve these problems. However, they're unaffordable, complex to implement, and difficult to maintain with a small number of staff. In these systems, only about 10 to 15% of the features are actually used by small businesses. Yet the providers, they charge full price. They have UIs that make it hard for the average small business operator to use. At Depot Buddy, we have a problem with this. The average SAP implementation is $16 million. The average NetSuite implementation is over $100,000 plus ongoing subscriptions. And the tier two player subscription fees will start at 50% higher than our proposed pricing. These are unaffordable costs. So how big is this problem? Well, there are over 9 million warehouse-based businesses globally. And just like old Trevor, there are over 3.7 million of them are suffering from inventory problems and stock imbalances. We expect that given the competition, and this is a big red ocean, we understand that, we have an opportunity to obtain just under 37,000 businesses. We'll reach this obtainable market using three methods. And this will be achieved after launching our MVP. 
We use a bottom-up internet sales approach focused on purchasing related workflows and word of mouth, solutions, marketplaces for accounting systems, and partnering with accountants and business advisors. Introducing Depot Buddy. So working closely with warehouse operators, we're delivering an easy to use web app which fills this gap. Affordable to implement and operate, the web app will always be co-created hand in hand with, <coughs> sorry, with our customers. For warehouse operators, by warehouse operators is our mantra. So Depot Buddy enables operators to maintain, forecast and buy stock from suppliers based on recommendations, take and process sales and push financial data to accounting platforms. Inventory order volumes are based on both available shelf space and shipping times. Traditionally, warehouse operators set minimum inventory levels, assuming future demand will be the same as past demand. Here at Depot Buddy, we're committed to empowering warehouse operators to know which products to buy, when to buy, and in which quantities. We'll use AI by combining sales history data with environmental data to provide better forecast accuracy. We have signed two customers with another two signing. We'll take on 10 foundation customers to help us with product market fit. We'll then launch our MVP. And in early next year, it'll be exciting as we're implementing some great features uh, such as AI demand forecasting. To grow quickly, we'll seek investment in early 2021. So we are seeking six new customers to join our foundation cohort. If you know of any small businesses that manage their warehouses using spreadsheets or existing software which they are unhappy with, please let us know. And as mentioned, we'll seek an investment in early 2021 to help with growth. So Julian and I met starting our MBAs at UQ. We have strong business and technical capabilities. Julian is an experienced former founder who has operated two warehouses and has a deep understanding of the industry. I'm an experienced operations manager with a technical background in data management and experience delivering IT services to global customers. Together, Julian and I co-founded Depot Buddy. We are empowering small wholesalers and distributors to effectively manage their warehouse operations. Thank you. Any questions? Fantastic. Thank you, Julian and Dan. Uh, we'll open up to the audience for Q&A. Feel free to come off mute and ask a question. I have a question. So when you set, when you set up a customer, there must be quite a lot of work to get a customer on board and to get their historical data so you can actually put that into your AI stuff to do the forecasting. Uh, you haven't said anything about that or therefore the associated what, what sort of charges you're charging to people for onboarding them and then on continually after that great question david um mm. implementation costs are a factor that needs to be taken into consideration one of the things we're going to be doing is ensuring that the data can be loaded up into the system easily um, we'll be building out an, an api to allow uh, integration into other platforms if needed um, so that we can pull in the necessary sales and purchase history. Um, if we can make that process as easily, completed as easily as possible, we can lower our costs for implementation for these merchants. We're also looking at some automated ways of uh, training and development as well. Um, we do know that there's a high onboarding cost, like you mentioned there, but uh, we're looking to, to make that as seamless as possible through uh, existing tools. Um, that are made available out there and uh, an initial consult period as well with new, new customers during the onboarding process. Okay. okay. Another one if there's nobody else. Um, yeah, so very often shortages in warehouses occur due to unexpected events like, you know, there's suddenly a worldwide shortage of memory chips and suddenly that, so what are you, are you going to do anything to assist people to predict the kind of unexpected? Particular industries will have access to certain types of information and they'll know the relationships they have with their supply, uh, with the vendors up the supply chain. Every industry will have those ex special external factors that need to be taken into consideration. Um, for example, the fashion industry obviously has their fashion trends and weather may play a part in that. So as part of the uh, modeling that will need to be completed. 
whether it would be a consideration for the fashion industry. Thank quick you, Julie. We've got... Go, Ken. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, how are you different from app systems uh, like the recent uh, Carton Cloud, even down here in the Gold Coast early heads? My understanding is Carton Cloud is specializing in warehousing and the transport and logistics industry. Uh, we'll be looking more about purchasing and forecasting of inventory. Thanks. In additional to that, uh, because we're looking at a certain price point, we're looking at small business, uh, we're looking at more automated tools and a lot of those uh, training tools as well to onboard customers to reduce the professional services capital expense up front. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kenneth, for the question. And thank you, Julian and Dan. Uh, and we are going to move over now to Lindy Chen from Frethen. Over to you, Lindy. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Lindy. Go ahead. Great. All right. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lindy Chen. I am the Chinese uh, Supply Management Consultant and also the founder of China Direct Sourcing and the founder of Friesen Technology. Recently, uh, Australian, supply, uh, Australian businesses find a, a supplier on Alibaba paid $80,000 and yet when he opened the container, it's uh, the load of sandbag. There are many problems in the international trade industry, such as the scammers on the uh, internet and also the inferior product, the delivery delay, as well as uh, the language barrier and uh, also the legal complication and also the culture difference. Over the last 15 years, we have helped over 2,000 businesses to import from China successfully. Between them, they have saved over $20 million. We won countless business awards, and also we have accumulated over 30,000 reputable Chinese supplier on our database. We are the only global uh, supplier, global uh, service partner of Alibaba in Australia. So, we have developed the unique three-stage importing process. Based on the product specification, we can do research and tender, sampling, purchase the negotiation, and production and the delivery management so that your products can be delivered to your door with quality on time. We are pretty happy with the results we got so far, and we love our jobs. However, we have our limitation. One is a centralized solution rely on well-trained China Direct team member. Two, we, it takes a lot of effort to facilitate one transaction. And number three, uh, our, the cost of a service is ranging from 3,000 to 10,000 per project due to the labor. Only certain customers can afford our services. We don't want to help just a hundred of businesses. We want to help millions and business worldwide. So we decide to automate our supply management consultancy with a tool called Frison. If that corporate wire buyer were on the Frison platform, one, the scammer would never pass the identity verification, two, pass any inspection. If unlikely event it happens, the evidence collected on the blockchain would be able to use the China internet code instantly. And the third, the reputation of the supplier will be ruined forever. So, Freeson will give you the proven template, the trusted supplier database, and the video clips of the great negotiation skill. So you are guided through the whole sourcing process, 10 times faster, simpler, and 10 times cheaper. Based on the product specification, Freeson automatically send it to the supplier on our database and save a huge amount of time. We do this with artificial intelligence and proven blockchain technology. No matter where you find your supplier, you can invite your supplier to join the Freezen platform. 
So Australian imports from China was 57 billion during 2019, and there are over 100,000 importers in Australia. Our target market is more and a medium-sized business with buyers, sellers, and the, uh, the third parties. So from the supply chain point of view, you can see Alibaba is focusing on the product and supply marketplace. Amazon is about the selling. TradeLens is about the digital shipping. And the trade community service is about the port and the customs. And Freeson is targeted at the Chinese supplier management system and managing the whole sourcing process. So we have identified the following key partners and then making them part of our ecosystem. So our business model is unique, like a membership subscription. We expect the revenue to reach 2023 by 16.1 million just in Australia with 17,000 membership. So far, we have completed the design of our Chinese blockchain platform and our English uh, uh, web website face. And also you can see the public front end. So, so far we have won uh, the Hong Kong IP hatch challenge and uh, we will partner with Panasonic. Last Thursday, we started 100 membership pre-sale campaign with um, uh, 10 already sold within one week, generated $25,000 revenue. So we are now on the second stage of Australian accelerating commercialization grant and we will take face into the world. We ask for $1 million investment. So China to Australia is only the step one. And then we will do back chi Australia back to China, China to UK, China to USA, vice versa. This is our team of technical experts, blockchain leaders, sales and marketing professional. And so guys, come along with us. Let's make sure that more business get their quality products on time with competitive price. Together with Friesen, we will all be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. To our audience, any questions? I'll ask one if no one else will. I mean, have, have you considered like, you know, acting as a sort of escrow agency? I know you're talking about using big, big chain or blockchain, but if you in fact acted as the escrow agency, so the, 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 the orderer in Australia paid you, and then when the goods were delivered, you paid the supplier when the, when the uh, person who'd ordered it said it was okay. That way you would avoid the copper wire bags of sand problem. Um, thank you, uh, David, for the question. And uh, one of the nature uh, as the blockchain had is actually the payment. So uh, one thing is in the blockchain and uh, it's generating the trust and uh, it's a trustless environment. And so you can actually generate a trust without uh, that particular uh, process. So um, then uh, not only that, and uh, using the escrow is one method, but also on blockchain, there are better solutions as well with the payment solutions. Except that with blockchain, you, Fretham, hold on to all the money and it's in your bank gaining interest if you can actually get it. Yeah, if it is the escrow, um, that's, that's true, yes. And uh, however, uh, so far we have designed the particular model is to uh, try to eliminate uh, that particular uh, trust issue and also minimize the risk for the buyers. So far, uh, Alibaba actually have escrow uh, services. And that's the area we don't want to directly compete with those e-commerce giant. We don't uh, position ourselves as a payment solution uh, flat platform. Thank you, Lindy. Any more questions for Lindy? I, I have one. Um, hi, Lindy. Thank hi, you. Hi, Tony. Um, I, just, I, I think I understood your revenue model is a subscription service where um, companies will subscribe to use the service. Is there any additional costs and is, is there a, a limit to how many times they can use the cost with the subscription service? 
uh, we have three different level. We have a subscription model for buyers, for sellers, and for third party. And there are three different levels, basic and standard and also premium. So if you just only have one project, you go to the basic uh, membership. Right. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. So so much, Lindy. Um, uh, great pitch, and we are now going to move over to Matt Home from UPay. Good afternoon, guys. My name is Matt Home, and I'm the CEO and founder of UPay. I'm here today to present you with a $24 trillion opportunity. That's right, I actually did say $24 trillion. That's the size of the problem that UPay is setting out to solve. Now, of course, I'll explain where that number came from shortly. But before I do, I wanted to tell you a quick story. It's actually the story of how UPay came to be invented. It's a story that only played out about three months ago. I asked my wife if she'd like a gift. I said, what would you like? And she said, I'd love this dress. So she shared a, an, an online link with me. She took me to a, a retail store that she frequents. And what happened then at that point in time, it dawned on me that I wasn't a customer of this store. I didn't know much about dress sizing or, or, or you know, all the different things that come with buying a, dressing and what, uh, buying a dress. And what should really be a really quick and easy process was quite difficult and time consuming. All I wanted to do was make the payment. All I wanted to do was gift. And it, it, was, it was incredibly difficult. Um, with Crystal being an active e-commerce shopper, as we all are these days, and myself having developed thousands of e-commerce websites over the last 11 years, uh, there really wasn't anything on the market like this. So we created it. We invented UPay. UPay makes it incredibly quick and easy, safe and secure for you to pay for someone else's order. The way it works is you just put your products in your shopping cart like you normally do, and you choose UPay as your payment option. At that point in time, a secure payment link is generated and you share that payment link with your chosen payer. Now, this might be a family member, it might be a friend, it might be a supporter, it really doesn't matter. And by doing this, what we realized is we had this massive target market. We have this global appeal, we have this big opportunity to, to target shoppers and payers, using the same example for myself and my wife or even parents wanting to empower and educate their children to be able to buy online safely and securely. And, securely. and charities, charities as well. This is a massive opportunity for charities. It has true global appeal. And the best thing about UPay, as we tell people about it, they're really telling us how it's really gonna be able to benefit their lives. Some people are saying to us, this is the Amazon wish list for the rest of the internet. Others say it's everything I would buy if I could. And the great thing about UPay is it's so simple. You use UPay any time the consumer is not the payer. Now, of course, we realized that UPay was just a great idea without merchants. We needed to make UPay attractive to merchants. And we're very, very confident we've done that. Here's a good example. In this particular situation, this particular shopper, her buying journey would have finished traditionally when she ran out of funds. Now, though, thanks to UPay, she can continue shopping and utilize the funds from someone else's wallet. Now here's those stats. Now we all know that the e-commerce market is growing at staggering rates. There were over 4 trillion US dollars in successful e-commerce transactions in the last 12 months alone. Uh, this space, as we all know, is dominated by big players like PayPal, Stripe, and the new kids on the block, their buy now, pay later providers like Afterpay. The interesting thing is this is just the tip of the iceberg. And this is the space we're gonna be playing in because those successful transactions, are just they only happen 15% of the time. 85% of all checkouts and cards are abandoned. They don't succeed. That leaves $24 trillion in US currency on the table. And that's where we wanna play a role. We wanna fix abandoned cards. Now we've all probably experienced this. Um, you might put a product from Kogan in your cart and you, you don't convert. So you go away and then half an hour later, Kogan sends you an email, why don't you buy? They send you another email the next day, another email the next day. It's almost the definition of insanity. But that's where we, we come in. We change things there. Now a UPay link can be shared and someone else can convert that order for you. Another thing that's getting a lot of interest from our early adopter merchants is the fact that for the first time ever, two unique human beings, two unique user sessions will be associated with the one order. And that's the first time that's ever happened. And from a marketing perspective, this is incredibly powerful for our merchants. 
This is how we make money. As I mentioned, we're only very young. We're only three months old. And these are the things we're trialing with our early adopter merchants. Uh, the big thing is that UPay will be completely free for the shoppers and the payers. And we take a clip of the credit card processes. If you use the default built-in credit card processing solution in UPay, or we charge a fee later if you in integrate your own payment system. Here's the team. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been a web developer and I run a web design agency. I have been doing so for the past 11 years. And that's why our MVP has been able to get off the ground so quickly. Uh, we're already up and running on one of Australia's largest appliance websites, Appliance Central. We sit proudly next to ZipPay there. You can choose to pay up front, as you know, and you can choose to pay in four easy installments thanks to ZipPay. Or now, you can actually pay zero dollars and let someone else pay for you thanks to UPay. Here's our roadmap. We've come a long way very quickly. We've got a lot of big uh, milestones ahead of us. We're going to be launching with 10 launch partners at the end of September. We want to be in 100 stores by Christmas and we will be raising money in early 2021. And that's where we think people on this call today could certainly add value. Uh, we do have some opportunities on our board of advisors that's quickly coming together. We do need connections with more merchants. So if you do think you can add value to UPay, uh, UPay please do reach out and speak to me after this. We're thinking big, so I guess it's uh, go hard or go home. This is a massive opportunity to take a big chunk out of a $24 trillion US problem. And I'm really excited to speak to anybody today who, as I said, could potentially add some value. If you'd like to check out UPay and try it for yourself, head on over to our website. We have our own online shop up and running. You can get one of these uh, funky t-shirts. Just drop me a UPay link and I'll be happy to grab it for you and ship it out. Thanks so much for your taking some time out of here today. And I genuinely look forward to hopefully chatting with a lot of you after. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. And we've already got a question from Anthony. How many UPay transactions have taken place to date? Well, only a handful. Um, so last count, last time I checked last night, probably 20 or 30. We're in um, yeah, two locations. We're in um, our own UPay store and that, that appliance central, as I, I mentioned earlier. Thanks, Matt. No worries. Have you, have you asked the merchants whether they're willing to pay? I'm not, I've got a reasonable, probably enough knowledge on FinTech to be dangerous, but um, are merchants willing to pay this additional half percent on top of all the other clips of the ticket they seem to cop along the way? Like there's a lot of nickel and diming goes on in this FinTech space. So are they comfortable to be paying another fee on top of all the other fees they pay? Hey, do you, have you researched that? Yeah, it's a really topical question. It's what we're exploring right now. That, that's why we're, we're, we're very keen to integrate a default native credit card facility in a similar sense to the way Shopify gets so much traction because you launch Shopify and you're instantly able to transact credit cards. Um, that, that's our, our kind of primary focus at the moment is to have an inbuilt default credit card processing facility built in with all the standard credit card fees that they would be accustomed to. Um, but then on, on top of that, yeah, you're right. It, it may even be a subscription model that, that fits best. Um, it's, it's a really, it's definitely something we're looking into and, and you're right, we are definitely talking to merchants about what would, what would fit best. And that's why we're keen to get those 10 partners on board as well. It's not really about necessarily generating revenue at this early stage. It's, it's exactly, as you said, kind of learning what fits and kind of growing from there. I'm sorry, one last, one last question. Well, how do you stop idiots, you know, blah, going, I want to buy this Ferrari and blasting it out to 500 people and have, trying their luck on someone to buy it for them? Well, I guess in, in theory and good on them and they might get lucky. The, the thing is when, when someone creates a UPay link, it's just an, an old on hold um, order. It's almost like an abandoned cart in itself. So it really for Ferrari in that particular instance, they wouldn't even take notice until, I don't know, what a Ferrari's cost a few hundred grand or a million bucks drops into their bank account with a successful payment. So um, by all means, if, if, um, someone wanted to do that in theory they could so we want to make sure that that doesn't impact the merchants if such a scenario does play out okay cool thanks matt thank you no worries. thank you anthony for the idea and we've got another question from michelle how and when does the merchant get paid what sort of delay are you seeing from the referred payment yeah no, great, great question and that's the thing this, this is a slower process and that's something that we're comfortable with of course we're you know we're encouraging our merchants to make sure they they go after the the customers right away with the instant conversion methods like Visa and MasterCard and PayPal and buy now, pay later. Um, but they, they get paid as soon as the, the, the payer executes the payment. 
Um, and and we, we encourage the, the merchants to integrate exactly the same payment methods that they already offer in their online shop today. So receiving a payment for an order is, is exactly the same as really if a cart was abandoned and then two days later they came, come back and then complete that abandoned cart. Uh, that's a similar process to you pay, but we're making it easier for people to, you know, if they, like I said, if you don't, if you don't have the money yourself, that's not the end of the journey. You can now actually get someone else to kind of jump in, in there and make the payment for you at a later date. Thank you. We've got one last question. What is stopping big players from copying your model? Yeah, I mean, of course, that, that that's always something that's top of mind and, and probably the number one question we get. They could, but the big thing is look at PayPal, for example. They've spent literally billions of dollars on research and development trying to create a one-click, very instant payment. Um, so for PayPal, as an example, to come out and say, we're going to introduce a technology that is designed to actually make it slower to convert a payment, um, I, I wouldn't see PayPal pushing that particular type of, of feature. I, I think they're really laser focused on that 15% of the market that I mentioned earlier. And, you know, we're, we're happy to, to jump on in there and take advantage of that 85% that's being left on the table there. So, yeah, sure, it, it could happen. Um, but yeah, I, th I think they're more, they're more focused on those instant conversions. Thank you very much, uh, Matt from UPay. And you. next up we have is Stephanie Khalil from Enroute. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Pauline. Hi, I'm Steph and I'm the founder of Enroute. As much as technology has advanced, it seems there is still no easy way to visualize an entire travel experience. I've been lucky enough to travel quite a bit and it doesn't matter how much I share of my trips on social media, I still get the same classic questions. How was your trip? What did you do? Where did you go? We try to share a whole adventure in the same way we share a plate of food or our morning coffee and it just doesn't cut it. I used our prototype to record my travels around Europe. We visited 25 cities across Europe within a month. Crazy, I know, but this is what the simple pinning of the points look like. I'd like you to imagine trying to understand, plan and book a similar trip for yourself. We are still duplicating the travel planning process when so many people have been on that journey before. Whether it's sharing our trips, understanding someone else's or even figuring out how we want to plan a future trip, we still have to do a lot more mental work to draw the dots. It's hard and it's time consuming. En Route is a travel app that allows you to share your own travel experiences and draw on others' journeys for inspiration and to book your next trip. As you move, your route is logged onto a map when you take photos, videos, check in, pins it all along the map where you've taken them. You can then explore and discover all the amazing adventures others have been on and duplicate and book a personalized version of the trip for yourself. So by piecing all of the moments of your journey together along your route as you travel, all of a sudden the experience you try so hard to explain comes together in such a simple, visual and interactive way. So what does travel look like today? Well, I can tell you a lot about how tourism was going last year, but let's just address the elephant in the room. What about COVID? Although we might not be able to travel internationally or interstate, a lot of intrastate travel is occurring. In fact, one potential partner who is a caravan retailer in Queensland mentioned that even without their road shows, which typically drive most of their yearly sales, have generated almost 10% more sales than last year already. And the projected global revenue for travel is still sitting at $536 billion. So people are trading in their overseas trips and seizing the opportunity to go on road trips and local holidays. User generated content via social media is also heavily influencing people's purchasing decisions. And this is especially true for millennials. Almost 40% won't even book accommodation without seeing some sort of user generated content. And let's talk Instagram specifically for a moment. Of the over 800 million plus users on the platform, 60% of users discover products on Instagram and a third go on to purchase. So the market for travel is widespread. People are still traveling despite COVID. And if people can purchase what inspires them when they view it, they will. Over the last two to three months, we have started to put out some strategic marketing campaigns to build some brand awareness and become familiar with our target market. 
On Facebook specifically, our page likes, engagements, and link clicks to our websites have gone up significantly, and the cost per conversion is under a dollar. In partnering with some of the biggest global travel communities on Facebook, we've also been able to achieve large growth organically. And I've also begun conversations with some key industry partners. The next six months will be about driving partnerships and building and testing the product with over 80 pilot members. The next six months following will be focused on driving downloads and building the data density to ensure that um, we're ready for phase three, which includes the addition of the booking system where driving sales will be the focus. And this aligns closely with our sustainable development goals. We start as predominantly a social platform, move into a more commercial model, and then having worked in the humanitarian sector myself, it was important for me that in future we look to incorporate a profit for purpose model to provide global opportunity for travel even across developing nations. So we're currently testing a business model, uh, not including paid advertising opportunities, which comes in at phase three with the integration of the booking system. So booking platforms will be charged a subscription fee to integrate with the application, as well as a five to 10% cut off the ticket as per the industry standard. Of course, in a sector like travel, you are bound to have competitors. Uh, these platforms either have the ability to log routes but don't take bookings, or they are able to only share and sell a singular point of interest but not an entire journey. The team is myself, the founder and CEO of Enroute, and my background is in project management in the health and humanitarian sectors. I have self and family funded to date. I'm asking for 160K to achieve the next month's roadmap. And that's inclusive of salaries to build the team, product and development costs, marketing and other administrative costs. I'm looking for investment, a CTO or tech founder, and further connections in the travel and hospitality industry. I'm Steph, the founder of Enroute, and I look forward to experiencing a better way that travelers can be inspired, share, plan and book their travels all in one simple and easy to use platform. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Over to our audience for any questions. Thank you for that, Stephanie. Um, sounds a wonderful app. What, who are your competitors out there? Yeah, so like I mentioned, we, we kind of have a split in the middle where people are at the moment, there are applications that are able to log routes. Um, our biggest competitor is probably Polar Steps um, and closely followed by Storyboard and some other variations. And then we have the booking systems. So we don't quite have something in the middle that is merging the two. And that's where we position ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Russ. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, good. My name's Tina. Hi, Tina. <laughs> can I can I ask um, if we were to in, invest? You you're looking for investors. Yes. Okay. So if where we if we were to invest, um, what's the benefits for us to invest in your company then? Well, it is a global opportunity. Um, we're we're seeking particularly when the booking platform comes in. Um, we'll be seeking to access the global travel market and take bookings from that. So um, if you think at the moment, um, Instagram, Instagram shop, people see a product, it comes up, or um, you know, an influencer posts a product and they actually have the ability to directly go and purchase because of that influence. And it's something that you know, they've seen and they've wanted and we're now taking that into travel and saying, you've seen a trip that has inspired you instead of trying to figure out and duplicate the process, we're actually going to immediately take the thing that you wanted and make it yours. So that's the, that's the product and that's the market. So if you find that that's something that you want to invest in, um, we've got it. <laughs> okay. So um, investment for, I think ma the majority of people is actually getting something in return. That's what an investment is. So what is it that you offer in return? In terms of for the monetary value you give, what does that equate to in, in terms of equity? 
uh, well, an investment is usually a percentage of something. Yes. So yeah, so we can probably, sorry, probably best to talk about that in the breakout room after if you're interested. Um, we are quite early stage, so it'll likely be a convertible note, but I'd, I can talk to you more about that afterwards you know, if you okay. like. Okay, so, so can I just ask how, uh, or what sort of an investment is it? Is it, is, is it like a return on, on, on uh, performance of the business or what is it? I might, I might just um, suggest we take that in the breakout room um, and I can uh, chat in the breakout room. If we, uh, you know, obviously investment is up to each investor's term sheet and what they're really looking to get out of an investment. And um, given Stephanie and Enroute are um, early stage, I, uh, I, I know this for sure that she's quite open to all different options of investors. Uh, so if we can chat in the breakout room, that would be fantastic because we do have some other questions as well. Um, uh, let me just go back up to them. Uh, one comment is from Michelle. Cool, I could see you partnering with Intrepid Travel as a question. I could see you partnering with Intrepid Travel as a question. Is that yeah. right? Um, there's definitely partnerships up for grabs um, and integration opportunities. We are talking to um, people at the moment, um, but yeah, where there's, yeah. So we, we are looking at booking.com and Intrepid Travel as, as potential partners. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, someone else has commented, what about Flight Center? Likewise, <laughs> um, and yeah, it's it's been unfortunate that they have let go of, of quite a bit of staff, but we have actually been in contact with some of those staff that have very good expertise in the tourism industry. So we have um, leveraged off that and are looking to Flight Center, yeah, as a potential partner. So yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, that's it for questions. So if you again have any questions, you guys do have the option to join our founders in breakout rooms. So if you would like to join a breakout room uh, after the pitches, which we only have two left, can you please send a chat message to River City Labs, who is in the, who is in the chat, and they will be able to push you into a breakout room after the pitches are done. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie from Onru. Uh, and next up, we do have uh, co-founders from Trade Finding, Adam and Chris. G'day, guys. I'm Cos, and I'm Adam. Together, we're the founders of Trade Finding. The man on the left is my dad, David. He's been an electrician for three decades and during my time as his apprentice, it became clear that there was no suitable or practical avenue to market himself online. Yeah, average small business owner like David has very, spends most of his time on the tools. Between that, inspecting, quoting and invoicing, he has very real time constraints. Time constraints that don't grant him the luxury of understanding the dynamic world of digital marketing. As of current, his best solution is service-seeking platforms and all they have to offer is a 1 in 11 chance of winning a lead. This means that 11 other trades on average are vying for the very same job and even after all of that, he's presented with a bill regardless of whether he has won the job or not. With all other options exhausted, Dave has now found himself in a very precarious situation where he is forced to advertise on the premise of a cheaper rate. Rates that are nowhere near proportionate to the years of dedication it took just to become qualified in this field. To be blunt, it's a slap in the face and a race to the bottom in terms of pricing is dangerous enough to degrade any industry. These issues are especially important given that we are relying on the construction industry to aid us in Australia's post COVID recovery. Undervaluing members of our most crucial sector is a huge mistake. Trade finding is different because it's built for tradies. Trade finding has removed the middleman, meaning we offer instant, free and open connection between businesses and their clients. Businesses will be able to comprehensively list themselves via their profile. Everything from an about me to a portfolio of their previous work, anything, yeah, from a portfolio of their previous work, anything that a trader would have on their personal website, they will now have on their trade finding profile. Alongside that, trade finding will be a platform for the average Australian need of a tradesperson to find a more dependable, local and experienced tradesmen and women. For tradies, time is money, and we want them to have more of both. What this boils down to is a complete lack of control on both ends. 
Trade funding eliminates the wastes of time and money for all parties involved by simplifying the communications channels and centralizing all their information. Here's a comparison of the business of business listings on our competitors' platforms. On the left is a free trade funding business profile. In the middle is a true local listing, and to the right is a yellow pages listing. Out of these three choices, who do you feel more comfortable hiring? Now, service seeking sites are still widely used as intermediaries in the construction industry. An average service seeking site gains 600,000 visits a month from both trade businesses and their clients. But here is what an industry leader looks like to the tradies. Now, I kid you not, these six trade businesses were the only ones out of two to 3,000 negative reviews that didn't have swearing in them. So if traders feel this way about service seeking sites, why do they use them? The answer is, there's absolutely no other option for them. Now, I don't want to overlook our competitors. They are deeply embedded in the industry and have a lot of manpower behind them. But I will say this, their lack of care for traders has created a huge opportunity for us to stand out. We're bringing a new mentality to an old industry. Now let's address the elephant in the room here, which is Google ads. Now, do you know that, the, that to have the top spot for the phrase electrician Brisbane for a whole month will set you back somewhere between 50 to $80,000? The thing is, most traders aren't Bill Gates and have a spare 50 grand laying around to pay Google. So our survey suggests that 72% of traders feel like our competitors charge them excessive fees to list their businesses. Alongside that, an astounding 83, 83% of traders agree that they need digital improvement with their clients. What we have just shown you over the last four minutes is our MVP, which only entails the top right-hand corner of this revenue model. Our revenue model is vast. What we are building is an ecosystem of tradespeople, a very specific and targeted demographic that needs digital improvement. There's a lot to unpack here, so I'll just quickly list a few that are underlined in red. These are trades business, coaching and consulting, sales and marketing tools, a, tra a tradey specific marketplace and human capital management tools for small businesses. Every aspect on our platform is designed to never unjustly charge tradies, rather to empower them with the tools they need to get the job done. Trade finding will always stay true to its mission of putting tradies first. We see trade finding becoming a hub of the industry, a place encapsulating every trade related sector where all users can connect, network and share. Our aim is to be investment ready in six to 12 months. We are currently in the process of building our MVP and creating a community of tradespeople who will grow and build a platform with us. We would love to start the conversation of raising a seed round and would appreciate your insights as Cos and I are in the early stages of this business endeavor. This isn't a bribe, but we'll shout anyone a beer who passes on an, us on to any relevant industry figures, please. Yeah. Cos and I have a strong vision. We are passionate about the trades because we both come from trade families. We genuinely want to help individuals like my father and both of our brothers who all happen to be sparkies. Let's start the conversation. Let's promote the trades and let's promote innovation. Thank you guys. Cheers guys. Thank you, Adam and Coz. And I believe we already have some questions from Patrice. How are you serving the other side of the market? What's better for the person hiring the trade than the experience on high pages? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so when you go on high pages and you, um, you basically request a job that you want to get done. Now they'll pass you on to five random tradies. So you don't really have a, a choice in that interaction. When you come on trade finding, you're very quickly finding a, um, a list of tradespeople that are based around quality. So you're able to pick the, the most relevant tradesperson to your job. So we're changing the industry dynamic rather than choosing who's the cheapest option. Now we're saying, okay, well, who did I like? Cause you're looking at what's their business like, what their mission is, who their employees are, what the individuals like and their portfolio of their previous work. So it's a choice made on quality rather than randomized. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, can I ask a question about that interaction? Yeah, for sure. Hey, yeah. Steve. Uh, I'm good, mate. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Um, that's a lot of information. So how am I going through that information? How am I finding that quickly? If I'm an end user, um, and um, the most important thing for me is to find a tradie who's going to be good, affordable, and available and respond on time, Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to have tolerance for maybe going through about three different options. Mm -hmm. It'd be a bit of a push to go through five. So how am I understanding what I'm seeing there that tells me all about their business um, and all the things you just said for five people in a very short amount of time? What's happening with the UI and journey there? 
So we're still building the MVP now. These are questions that we're going to work through um, as, as we go. So it's very early stage in terms of development. But um, it would be very similar to, to other search engines that there currently are. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, if you were to search up businesses on, on LinkedIn, for example, if you are after specific business, that's one way it will work. If you, we're going to have a search engine with a pretty niche criteria and we want to outlay everyone as evenly as possible. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, basically it's going to give you a randomized um, list of, of businesses based upon a few generic sort of things that you've put in. Yeah, giving you the control. So that way, say for example, you need an electrician, you filter through, you go electrician, what's the urgency of it? Okay, I need it immediately. Who am I gonna get in touch with? Okay, here's a profile, let me check him out. Where is he based? What's he about? So the outlay of the information, do you, it would be more like a Facebook outlay in a sense, or even just a LinkedIn style. We're still discussing what we're going to be doing with that. But um, for you as an end user in regards to that, you have more control to see who you're going through and what you're, what you're expecting from that person. Yeah, so in terms of how quick that lays out, it's, it'd be fairly easy to take in because we're all pretty familiar with the uh, um, social platforms nowadays. So um, how do you currently hire a tradesperson, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, the last one I hired, I use service seeking. Okay. And how was that? How was that process? Did you find it fairly streamlined? Did you like them coming to you rather than you going to them? Uh, it was okay. It was, um, yeah, it worked, it worked okay. Um, it wasn't great. Yeah. See, so that, yeah, that's the thing. And on both ends, there's those issues. So now by you putting in your search preferences and you selecting out of those five or you press enter and you get another five, um, now you're choosing based, you're choosing based upon um, someone you've picked because you, you'd like, you, pre you prefer that business. So rather than them coming to you, you've chosen them. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just thinking it's an interesting, it's an interesting set of um, complex issues that you're having there. Yeah, mm. there's a fair few. Well, we'll talk yeah. through. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's early stage of the actual yeah. development of it. Very exciting project. I really like the sound of it. We're doing out the um, the wireframe now. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like Steve wants to do some designing. Um, so no, thank you, thank no, you, Steve, for that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> we 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 actually do have quite a few other questions, but we're at the top of the two minutes. So can I suggest to people to please um, feel free to uh, join the trade finding breakout room shortly? Because without further ado, we are going to move on to Sharon Doolan from Zigit. Last but not least. Thank you, Sharon. Hello, I am Sharon Doolan, founder of Zidget. I want you to imagine for a moment you're in a movie, but your name's not in the credits. You're not recognized at all. So you go to IMDB, the Internet Movie Database. Again, there is no record of you. A friend of yours has got a hit song on the radio. Fabulous song. So you click on Shazam, but there is no recognition for that at all. It sounds crazy in this day and age when we can find people so quickly on Google and just a click that there is no recognition whatsoever. But that is the reality for millions of people worldwide, people who work in the creative industries, highly skilled and highly invisible. You, you see their work, you hear their work, you love their work every single day on radio, TV and the internet. But the question is, who are they and how do you contact them? It's a problem. How do I know? Do you recognise this? Authorised by the Australian Government, Canberra. I'm the voice. But who are the other people who are involved in the same advertising campaign and how do you contact them? So over the past couple of weeks, I've spoken with over 48 people from around the world, surveys, interviews and workshops. The interviews and workshops went for over an hour each time. But from the surveys alone, nine out of 10 people signed up straight away for the beta testing of this program because there is a big problem. Finding their next job is hard. They want to be recognised and discovered and they hate competing against hobbyists and newbies on price. It is being driven through the floor particularly now with COVID. So here's our solution. It's an app rather similar to Shazam, and it comes up with a clickable list of credits. How does it work? At point of job, the talent inserts and tags themselves into the job before passing it on. Those tags all end up being this clickable list of credits. The blue 
is paid subscribers and they can go across to the profile page. The gray is unpaid, but they are still subscribers. Makes marketing and point of contact really easy. And that's not the only thing. Here are some other benefits. Intellectual property, provenance of the creative industry, amplified marketing for free. So let's take a look at the market. This is just from LinkedIn and this is six categories of the creative market. Nowhere near exhaustive, but that's nearly 24 million people, not including digital and social media. So we originally set out to fix a massive problem in the freelance industry for the creatives, but you know what? There is the other side of the coin of businesses and agencies. It is a symbiotic relationship. All of us want discoverability, recognition, amplified marketing, and immediate direct contact. So that is the other side of the coin. Now, doing this clickable list of credits, we end up with a lot of data. So using that data effectively, we're building an industry-specific platform with the best of all of these platforms. Profile pages, drag and drop workflow, embedded info, social networking, career pathway from newbie right through to professional and an industry specific job board. So how do we make money? Let's start with the original premise of the clickable list of credits. 24 million people identified on LinkedIn. Just say 3% of that marketplace decided that signing their name to their work, being discoverable and being contactable, just 3% thought it was worthwhile. That's 500,000 people at $10 per month to maintain that clickable link. That's $5 million per month. That's not including the other side of the, the coin, nor including any of the other benefits on the platform. To date, so far, we've spent over $11,000 on the MVP. By the end of January, we'll have the embedded tech and the scalable database out to launch. The following couple of years, we will embrace all of the other features and benefits that we were talking about earlier. It's going to be a wild ride. Our team, John Burkett, mentor and co-founder, and Earl Rowan, consultant developer. And you, the ask is for a tech co-founder, very tech heavy, $350,000. Most of that is for the tech. 10% is in reserve for Murphy's Law, because Murphy's Law is a real thing. So if you want to help us transform an entire industry, help artists to sign their name, let's talk. I'm Sharon. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Sharon, we have a lot of people fanning out on your voice on the chat. Uh, <laughs> so I will try and navigate through those uh, very uh, excited people to find the questions or open it up to the audience. Do we have any questions for Sharon? Thank you. Sharon, do you, it's from Ian, do you know the folks at Jackstar? Sounds like they are building something similar for the music yes. industry. I am very familiar with Jackstar. They're bringing back the, um, the whole premise of the old album covers. And again, same premise is that people need to be recognized on the old v vinyl albums. We used to have all of that information. They're bringing it back and you know, kudos to them. Awesome. Um, we've got one from Paul. So I love the idea. So what about those scared by agency experience where they demand you sign away your individual rights to attribution? Attribution. Sorry, scarred by agency experience where they do. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, where they um, want your your IP forever and a day to do what they want with it, however they want. Yes. Well, this is part of the reason why I want to change that. You embed your details. That goes with your work permanently. It means that you can be discovered. You can be found. Do we have any other questions for Sharon? There's a lot of wrong in the industry. You know, for all of the creators, there's a lot of wrong that's that's been happening, a lot of hurt. Um, Being Sharon, discoverable is, is going to change that. Sharon, we do have a question on your traction so far. Mm -hmm. The traction was just in the past couple of weeks. I, I've been speaking to people for, for quite some time about this, but um, just in the past couple of weeks, speaking to 48 people from different countries and asking them their pain points. 
So it started out with surveys, then it went through to interviews and workshopping and asking them specifically what the problem was and what do they want in the future. So all of the benefits that I spoke about that would be on the industry specific platform that also came from talking to these people. And the workshops went generally over an hour each time. So they were very comprehensive. Uh, we do have another question from Paul. For musicians, distribution is a big thing and costly. How do you help this? For musicians, distribution is a, a big thing. This is not so much for musicians. There's a lot of a lot of help for musicians, though if musicians are in um, uh, say advertising, marketing or digital media, they are recognised as well. Does that make sense? Yes. And yes, I'd like to see blockchain go into the idea as well for traceability. I think that that would be awesome. That is something that uh, I'd like to see built in down the track. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon from Zigit. So just a reminder um, to pop in a, a founder that you would like to go and see or a startup that you would like to see in the breakout room and you will be moved over to those breakout rooms. At any point in time, you can message uh, the River City Labs via chat to be asked to move into another breakout room. I would just like to say thank you everyone, all our founders uh, for pitching uh, this evening. You have done a remarkable job. Um, and you can now take a uh, breathe a sigh of relief as you go into your breakout rooms and have some more time to network um, and meet different people uh, and answer some more questions. A big thank you and shout out to our entrepreneurs in residence. Um, Peter Laurie and Lou Jury, we couldn't do it without you. And we really appreciate all your support, your energy, your encouragement and your coaching towards the teams in getting them to the position they're at today um, and we look forward to them grow further in the next three months as they continue to be part of the River City Labs community um, and get access to all of the rest of our mentors. We have a few of our partners who have been helping us along the way. A big shout out to Anthony Owen, who's I can see there and I think I saw Cal also from Cake Equity. Thank you so much guys for all your support and meeting with uh, the founders as well and supporting them on their journey. Uh, without further ado, we are going to move into uh, the breakout rooms. Uh, if you do at any point uh, get stuck or need help, remember to send a chat message um, to River City Labs. A lot of kudos to all the team members um, who pitched tonight in the chat, so feel free to uh, read that later. And thank you everyone for joining us on your Friday evening.